What is going on? I want to welcome you from Half Court for today, Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. I am your host, John Murphy, alongside my guy, Jeff. I, Freddie. Jeff, good to see you as always, my guy. Oh, yeah, it's good, man. Coming off a, it's it was a loss yesterday for the Pistons, but other than that, watching playoff football, trying to get my mind off of it. Um, every time we play the Knicks, I just can't. I, I hate the Knicks. I don't know why they don't ask me, but every time the Pistons play the Knicks, I just end up turning it off late in the fourth quarter because I get frustrated. Uh, yeah, no, I get it. The Knicks, the Knicks piss me off too. I think it's just because knowing that James Dolan is a human being <laughs> yeah. that gets yeah. to exist and own an NBA team, let alone the New York mother Knicks in the Madison Square Garden. It's it's it infuriates me. It just does. I can't yeah. lie. So I'm with you there. But also with us here is my guy. Troy, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, man. Some good NBA games on this afternoon. I'm sure we're going to talk about that uh, later uh, for MLK Day. But I also, I got to to go to a good NBA game uh, on Friday night. What got to watch Hawks and Pacers. Got to see Trey Young in person. That was pretty cool. Um, and then the Hawks won off a game winning tip in uh, by John Collins, and it was uh, it was a good game. But uh, anytime you get to see a game winner in person, it's it's fun. So oh, one hundred percent. And yeah, J- yeah, Troy, you brought it up. This is a special week in the NBA world where. You know, this past Monday, as we're recording right now, is MLK Day, which, you know, obviously is a momentous part of the calendar. You know, a day where we can celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and everything that, you know, everything that he did. But in addition, you know, in the NBA world, the way that we honor and celebrate his legacy is through playing the game of basketball and competing at the highest level. And just about every single NBA team except You know, a few exceptions, the Pistons and the Bulls obviously being exceptions since they were traveling, you know, to Paris to play in their game in France on Thursday, uh, which is something that I'm definitely excited to tune into. Uh, But there was a lot of really good basketball to Troy's point being played. My personal highlight of the day, you know, I'll, I'll say this really quickly before, you know, we get into other stuff. Walker Kessler. Going back to going back to Minnesota, the team that traded him and being the first rookie since 2014 to post a 2020 game and get the game winner to beat the Timberwolves too. Just chef's kiss. <laughs> chef's kiss. How we crap on the Timberwolves all the time. Just oh, just beautiful. It, uh, I'd love it, to hear your guys. Was it was it Walker Kessler making uh one one million dollars or was that Rudy Gobert? I, I couldn't see. I saw twenty and twenty. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Walker that. Kessler making a million dollars. It's Rudy Gobert making about forty to fifty million dollars, <laughs> and he re-aggravated his groin uh, strain and played about five minutes. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for me, it just as a, ever since I was a kid, those are the type of games that I just love to watch. Is when a player who gets traded plays his former team and just annihilates them, right? I mean, that is just yeah. we could do a Mount Rushmore of greatest performances of debuts against your old team sometime, or, or the, even the, just or even yeah. just like the draft dis, right? Like the draft dis yep. players, like those, yeah. like oh, you I could have been here, y'all right. could have had me, you had your right. chance, yeah, you let me walk away. Yeah, or the teams that say, you know, you're the 10th overall pick in the draft and you have a good game against the the nine other teams that that uh, pick someone else over you. Those are the type of games, too, that are really fun to watch. And, uh, like yeah, the Jalen Duran game in Charlotte where right. it was like, how in the living hell did you let this guy out of your organization? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Plenty of opportunities like that to celebrate games like that. But for his point, like Jeff said, too, um, yeah, to the fact that you traded a guy like Rudy Gobert and you're getting better stats out of a guy that you threw in the package. Now, to a Pistons fan, that kind of hurts our heart with uh, Chris Middleton just getting thrown in there with the Brandon Jennings trade. But uh, we're not talking about that's 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 ages ago. We're talking about I'm right here, right now. Dead inside, anyway. <laughs> yeah, and all yeah, all these people that you know that that saw the Chris Middleton trade happen are like, oh, we should trade Sadiq Bay and see if we can get a return. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea, guys. Brilliant. Speaking <laughs> of, let's talk more trade deadline because, guys, it is coming up quicker and quicker and quicker. We are three weeks away from the NBA trade deadline, and this is going to be where you're going to want to get all of your NBA coverage surrounding the deadline. Guys, we should maybe do like a special 
NBA trade deadline pod or like NBA trade deadline stream around that day. Well, we should, we should, we should plan that after the pod, but anyway, yeah, that would be absolutely fun. But anyway, with that, James Edwards, the third released his latest article on what he is hearing surrounding the Pistons trade deadline and everything surrounding that. And from the sounds of it, the, the status is not much different from the speculation and the conversations that we were having before. If it sounds like if I had to do a ranking of you guys for you guys of like from from James's reporting, if I had to speculate personally who would most likely be traded and rank it, it would go number one to be Nerland's Noel. Um, from the reporting, it sounds like him and the organization both agree that moving on would be beneficial for both sides. Um, for the Pistons, either they can do it at the deadline and see if they can get something in return now, or in the off season, they can, they can decline the option or they can pick it up and do a trade as well. Um, it sounds like they are working, working with him to do that. It sounds like the Mavericks, the Nuggets and the Heat are the most prevalent teams in that conversation. Uh, and then it sounds like, uh, Bojan would be the second most likely. It sounds like the Pistons would would not be opposed to trading Bojan, but reporting suggests that they would need an unprotected first round pick at the very least in order to do that deal. And then I would say from there, it sounds to me like it would go, it, it, it would be tied between Alec Burks and Sadiq Bay. It sounds to me from the reporting that the unless they get an offer that they're blown away by, it sounds to me like Sadiq and, and Alec Burks are going to be in the Pistons uniform going into next season hearing that reporting jeff and troy what are your guys's reactions do you think that is the right approach to go into this trade deadline do you see a team being willing to give up a unprotected first round pick for Boyan? and do you does it matter to you what team it would be I'll, I'll start troy i'll start with you what are your thoughts yeah yeah no i think um nothing there really surprises me i think uh, a guy like neuron zarel you know serviceable min minutes and like you talked about i think in uh your other video you know he's kind of a guy that we kind of just took on with his contract really kind of thinking that he'd be a backup to uh you know isaiah stewart and you know when if, if jalen duran needed to get minutes you know in the g league this is before you know uh we actually saw him play but if he were to have minutes in the G League, you know, he would be a guy that would be serviceable. But obviously we knew how ready Jalen Duran is for the league. So really his minutes haven't really been there. Uh, we know that what he can do in the past, you know, especially when he was in Philly, um, you know, yeah. that was kind of ages ago as well. But, he's played all right in like yeah, the few games yeah. that he's that he's had to hop in, especially of late. Right. I mean, Jalen Duran with that sprained ankle, yeah. you know, the ankle soreness he's dealing with, you know, yeah. he, he's yeah. he's always he, he's he's been ready to go when needed, which right. all the credit in the world to him for that. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think he's what we expected, at least what I expected going into this season with his minutes and his production. Um, Bojan being second also doesn't really surprise me. I still don't necessarily think a deal will get done, but if a deal does get done, um, the only team that I feel like that would be willing to give up an unprotected first round pick that we might want to consider taking advantage of would be the Lakers, right? Because unprotected first round pick, uh, that very well could be a top five pick in the next two or three years, you know, especially with what we have going, what, what they have going on over there. Yeah. Um, I, I guess. Yeah, go ahead. But, but even then, Troy, sorry to interrupt. As of mm -hmm. as as of recording, you know, currently, you know, like go going into today, like at this point, the, the Lakers are a bottom three seed in the in the Western Conference. They would currently be three games back of Utah, um, in that tenth spot currently. And there are, you know, the Suns and the and the Thunder in those spots as well. So it is interesting to see as you know, as time goes on, as Anthony Davis is missing more time. You know, from the sounds mm -hmm. of it, he might be back before the All-Star break for a couple games, maybe. Yeah. I'm going to say I doubt it. I'm very right. skeptical that's going to happen. But at the same time, yeah, you're right, Troy. Like, of the of all the teams I would picture personally being willing to give up an unprotected first-round pick that at least would have value or, like, true value, it would be the Lakers. Like, maybe the Bucks would. Maybe the, the, the Cavaliers would. But... What like, but do you want that unprotected first round pick? That's if I'm the Troy Weaver, I don't. If I'm Troy Weaver, I don't. I want the absolute best deal ever, and I just don't see a Milwaukee um, or a Cleveland producing the best deal because Bowie. We have to understand like Bowian is giving great minutes, and 
you know, we, we have to get the best deal, but also moving forward in the next year, um, like you mentioned in, in uh, the previous pod, uh, Sean, you know, say we do land a Victor Wimanyama. I'm not speaking into this into distance, but say we do. Say we sign uh, another free agent. No, no uh, matter what, we're getting yeah. a top five caliber yeah. talent in a generational draft. Okay. So yeah. no matter what, you can say right. we're getting a damn. We're getting a we're getting a high valued prospect. No matter what in this year's draft. So with that said, if a Bojan can be a fifth option or a sixth option on that team on next year's team watch out uh, meaning that it might be worth considering bringing him back next year and not having a bench with Bojan and Alec, Alec Burks. Burks I was gonna say that too Alec Burks um I yeah he, he's a guy that's I think been underrated this year we haven't been talking about enough of how much of a bucket getter he's been getting and just uh the production and his field goal percentage too is is higher than I think last year as well, too. So really, he's making more shots, too. He's getting more touches and making more shots. Oh, my so, gosh. He's been phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah he's he's averaging 46% from the field, 45% yeah. from beyond the arc, and about 14 points a game. Like, like, what else would you want from, you know, from a scorer coming off your bench? Like, this was a like this was one of the things that we were saying that we needed in this second unit badly was a guy who could just go get a bucket and could do it with poise. And Alec Burks is that guy. I mean, in particular, I think of that two game stretch mm-hmm. where he missed what three shots. Like the guy's a maniac. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to talk about the list you gave, I'm not like Troy said, I'm not surprised. I think Nerlens Noel being number one, it's, it's not surprising. I mean, if you look at a guy who's going to be cheap, especially for contenders, I mean, every contender you could argue could use a guy like Nerlens Noel. He's cheap. He could play minutes off the bench. He's good defensively, which. Him starting for Duran, that's probably been the number one thing. I'm like, people forget how good defensively Nerlens Noel is. Like he'll yeah. he'll fill up a box score. You give him 20 minutes, he'll get you three steals, two blocks. He's got value. So the Nerlens Noel thing, not surprised. Bojan, not surprised because I listen. I, we I, we talked about this, and and I, you guys were were kind of on different sides of this. For me, wouldn't have a problem if he stayed, but I'd also kind of push to to maybe see what kind of deals are out there. I mean, like we always say, he's going to be 34 in a couple months, and, and well, I think Jeff- he's playing. The best basket. What? What? What's up? No, I'm sorry. Well, Jeff, what I was just going to say is, I think Detroit holds both of our viewpoint. Like, I, I think if you if you listen to like the reporting, I think the, like their stance is like, yeah, we like we certainly wouldn't mind moving Bullion if the deal's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? As it should be. You're not going to force. You're not going to f- trade them for you know scraps. You you want the deal to be great, right? Um, right. But it's on the table, right? Yeah, exactly. And that and that's exactly what I mean is like, I think it's kind of like that middle thing is like, you know, I think Detroit's in and, and I think that's the ultimate point is that they're in that luxurious position because of good general management work because mm-hmm. of, of solid decisions because this guy decided before the season to take Kelly Olenek and Saban Lee and flip that and see what he could get out of Bojan. Now, if he does get an unprotected first round pick, regardless of what organization that's from, that's more valuable than Kelly Olenek or Saban Lee. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Knowing what Troy, uh, what Troy can do. Yeah, 100%. Especially so, what he did with that Milwaukee pick. That's why, I like, the picks to me, if you're, if you're going to use the pick, I agree with you guys. I think the Lakers, you're looking at teams that are going to stink, but – I mean, even if the Milwaukee Bucks, probably not the Cleveland Cavaliers because they're in our division and I don't want to see Bojan, you know, as much, you know, per season. But those first round picks, I wouldn't be shy away from those either, because at the end of the day, Troy, you, you've seen him maneuver like that. That Milwaukee, what was it? 2025, 2026, whatever it was, 2024. Uh, the fact that he turned that into Duran, like it's Milwaukee's pick. I, I, I'm not going to question what he can do with first round picks. So the team, right. I get what you guys are saying, but at the end of the day, Give me an unprotected first round pick. I don't give a damn who it's from. I think yeah. that's a good deal. If you can get more with it, not just a first, it's got to start right. off with a first. Right. But and hey, I, and I it's think, not surprising. Yeah. And I think for me personally, like if I, I guess my preference would be if you were to take a pick on for the sole purpose of using it as a future asset to trade, because I think we can all acknowledge if we're to get an unprotected first round pick, it's not to keep. Right. Right. Like we all acknowledge that. Right. It's a, right. it's eventually flip. So like that, like my my I guess my personal preference would be to do it the way that Troy did. Troy did it with with Jeremy Grant, where you don't necessarily have to make that will pull that trigger at the deadline. You're not you're not in a in a position where 
you know, like there's like, you have to do it now. Like this is when he's at his most valuable. Like, I'm sorry. Does he just all of a sudden lose value? Like in the off season, like are, are people not going to look at a guy who's like a career 50, like around 50% shooter, uh, you know, a guy with an effective field goal percentage of 57, 58%, even if he's not, you know, a, a first or second option on your team, ideally that's not where you want him to be anyway to succeed. So like, are you telling me like that's not still valuable in the off season? And at that point, you know, teams have more salary cap room at that point, teams are more have more clarity with what they want to do with their players. And at that point you could potentially make three team deals, but package those, those picks at that time. Like I, I guess that would be my ideal scenario, but mm-hmm. at the same time, like you said, if that's available and, you know, and if Troy does think that is valuable, like if that is like the movie wants to make, it's certainly not a bad deal or a bad position to be in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No question. And I think, you know, going into, you know, going into the deadline, I, I think the, the big thing and the ultimate message that um, that I'm getting there are the sense that I'm getting from this deadline reporting is that the Pistons do still believe that next year is when both they can turn a corner and when they want to turn the corner. And so I think if anything, what this reporting shows is continued confidence in, you know, the process that they've been going through and what, you know, and what they have in place. I think despite, you know, some of the difficulties and some of the things that they've been enduring on the defensive end, I still think we're seeing more and more improvement from guys like Killian Hayes, you know, who's, who's continuing to have consistently solid performances, you know, Jaden Ivy in particular, you know, over the last few games is, you know, is up to his, you know, is up to his playmaking, but also his, his shot making has been more efficient as well. Overall, like, you know, I think it's one of those things where I think the, the light is very much at, you know, at the end of the tunnel. And I don't think that light is as far away as people put it out to be. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. So no matter what, I think as we keep heading into the deadline, I, th- I think most certainly if there's anyone that, you know, can, uh, that, you know, that, that can be aggressive, it's Troy Weaver. And having said that, do you think there is going to be like a nut? Like, do you think there is going to be like an experimental move by Troy Weaver, this, this deadline? Like, because if you look at what he's done so far, like on trade deadline, he's, he's, a, this would be his third deadline, right? His first one, he, uh, I, I believe that was when he, yeah, that was when he acquired Dennis Smith Jr. And traded De- Derek Rose to the Knicks. And then, uh, you know, this past trade deadline was when he went and got Marvin Bagley from the Kings. You know, I know obviously this, you know, before this season was kind of was when he was a little bit more aggressive, you know, getting guys like you know, Kevin Knox into the system, getting, you know, Bojan before the season. Do you think Troy Weaver could possibly make an experimental trade like that, trying to get an ex- get a young player into the system? Or do you think that he's going to try to stay packed with some of the projects that we have in-house? You can go, Troy. Yeah, I'll probably go with the second option. I think I think he likes what he has in house. I think um, we see production, especially like even like the signing of Kevin Knox. I feel like was an experience. And even Hamadou Diallo of late has yeah. been really turning up too. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. So I, I just feel like we have a lot of already Troy Weaver young projects. I would still call M- Marvin Bagley in a lot of ways a project, um, an experiment, right, as you mentioned, to get here. So yeah, I the just hand injury. Like we, the hand injury does deter that a little bit. Right. But. Right. We, if I'm Troy Weaver, I just can't be doing bringing in experiments every trade deadline. I no. I just feel like we have to work within in house kind of at this point um, in the rebuild. But also, I just feel like Troy Weaver's Christmas, if you will, is going to be draft day, not necessarily the trade deadline, in my opinion. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong bringing in projects when you stink, but there's eventually going to be a time where, like this offseason, you talk, you just mentioned it, Troy, where they, or excuse me, Sean, where they want to take a next step next season. So I, don't, I think the whole project era is kind of coming to a close. I think they yeah. have enough young talent, and now they've mixed that in with veterans, which they like, like a Alec Burks, a Bojan. I, I, I don't think taking out a pro- if he does we'll see who it is it depends like there's different types of projects there's 
you know, Marvin Bagley, who's already a serviceable player. I think there's a lot of things you yep. like, or a, a, a guy like a Kevin Knox who had really no value, but he's showing value. Like it, I guess it depends on the player, but no, to answer the question, I, I don't think he'll take a project. I think this trade deadline, there would be an upgrade or trading away aging veterans that are playing really well, like Bojan to go get assets. But right. I, I think this trade deadline won't be as, as noisy. I think as, as people might expect, I don't know. Something just tells me, but never count out Troy man makes deals in his sleep. Yeah, I think yeah, I think to your guys' point, I don't think the the rumors are as rampant as they were last season. Yeah. I think you know it, it is it is interesting because if you do look at it for the second year in a row, I would argue the Pistons have the most coveted prize in the NBA trade deadline. Like I would say, Bojan Bogdanovic is probably the one of the one of if not the hottest name. In you know in in uh you know in in trade deadline talks and then I would say Jeremy Grant last year was the hottest name too so you know the fact that you know Troy Weaver's putting himself in positions to where people are ringing his phone and people are calling us about our players because let's be honest when we were stinking and when we weren't that good back in the day people weren't exactly inquiring about what we had in house yeah. we didn't exactly have assets that people did that people wanted. Because they weren't on great contracts, because they were dealing with health issues, right? Like that's especially that's that 2020 year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and and with that, like there's like that gives you contingencies, like like let's say like let's say there was like you know even more injuries, or God forbid, like there was like something that happened, like one of our rookies, like we could potentially like you know pivot and and rebuild another year if we need to. But at the same time, if it's like holy cow, this team's way better than we thought, we could just go all in and do this like you know, mega push because that's exactly what you want. You want options and that's where we're at. So yeah, yeah, man. I, and I think at this deadline, like you guys said, I think, you know, it's like when there's smoke, there's fire. And I think, and I think it's been more so smoldering and it's been, you know, pretty, pretty quiet so far, but I'm definitely excited to see what happens league wide because I don't think that's going to be the same case for the rest of the league. I think this trade deadline is going to be bananas. Yeah, and which is so crazy to me because there hasn't been a trade yet this season, to my knowledge. It's at least worth talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's been a couple of small ones that I'm not that's not coming to mind right now, but there's really been no trade since the summer. No, yeah, not brutal. a significant one, Troy. Like you said, it's been it's been pretty small ones, if anything. There hasn't been a major trade, and I think you know, I think it's because a lot of teams, some teams really like where they're at, and some teams really don't like where they're at, but like what they have, you know what I mean? And I think that's the interesting thing, but you know, one team, and I think if there's like, you know, there's, there's, there's this team that keep, that keeps coming up as, as far as like a, they got to blow it up. They got to blow it up. This team's going to make a change this deadline. And at first I thought it was going to be one team. However, it's been going a very different direction. And that team guys is now the Toronto Raptors because yikes, Yikes, yikes. Uh, latest things that we're hearing, this is from CJ McCollum. There's rumblings about certain players on the team not being happy and due to tampering. I can't speak to that, but I think they're going to move someone. So if CJ McCollum, who, let's, by the way, give a little bit of context, is the league, is the president of the NBA Players Association. So I would say he's probably a little bit in tune with what's going on there. A little bit yeah. of context. You have to be voted by the players to get that position. So guys like him. So if, if he has intel, it's probably pretty good intel. Yeah. Uh, guys, I'm going to go out on a limb. The Raptors are going to make a change because this team sucks yep. so bad. And they have a ton. They have great assets too, and that's why we we mentioned the Toronto Raptors before on this podcast, talking about the assets they have. I think OG and Anobi would be the most, at least to me, the most attractive, you know, if he's available, uh, player at the trade deadline because of what he can do defensively, and, and he's taken a step offensively. He's a, he's a fantastic player, and they have a couple of those guys. And I don't know if they they like what's currently constructed around Scotty Barnes. I, the, the Raptors are in a very interesting place. That's why we talked about him on the pod. It's like. You got some young guys. You got some veterans in there. Do they all fit? I don't know. But you still have attractive players. So the Raptors, to me, that's not surprising to hear that. Um, I think the guy, the, the number one 
you know, player that teams are going to be calling about is, is OG and Anobi, maybe Siakam too. Yeah, I've heard he's, rumblings uh, on uh, on the Hoop Collective pod on uh, from Brian Windhorse. There's there's belief in in certain league circles that a OG and Anobi trade could could have a Rudy Gobert Donovan Mitchell type return, which sure. I don't know if if he garner if he should garner that type of return. But the fact that that's that's what's being talked about. And the yeah, fact that yeah. that's how valued he is in league circles. I mean, first of all, to me, that just tells you the opportunity that Toronto has in front of them. Like clearly like in front of their lap, like, Hey, this isn't going well. You have the eject button and it's shiny. It's, it's like this, button. it's like, you know, this is going to work. You know, this could immediately put you in a position, you know, to be, you know, to be in greener pastures going forward. Like you just have to do it because if you're trying to hold on, for you know for right now if you're trying to like you know drag this team into the playoffs right now you have three wins more than orlando orlando is not exactly in a position to try and contend like toronto was trying to i mean this this raptors team was trying was was pretty close to beating the 76ers in the playoffs last like this this raptors team i was freaking hyped about going into this season this team is ass mm -hmm. like just get just get it over with blow it up man yeah like, and siakam's putting up okay numbers at least in the beginning of the season um mm -hmm. and i feel like a guy like uh og ananobi i think would be valuable especially if a contender could 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 go for him but i feel like i don't know I, they they have the assets, but I just I there's really not like a player or, or you know that comes to mind where you know they're screaming that they want out you know where you could make a package there. I, I just I'd be very curious to see what would happen, but I'm with you, Sean. Something does need to happen. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, the Bulls are certainly another team you can make that sig similar argument. However, I know Patrick Williams has been improving of late. I know Zach Levine has been looking a little bit more like himself. I know. You know, they might be selling themselves a little bit more on what they have in house, which, you know, if that's what they want to do, that's their funeral. But, you know, I think for the Raptors, you know, I think they're a team that they might not get quite to the assets that Utah got in, you know, like in like the Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert trades, because, you know, all, all together, they got, you know, just an insane amount of picks. But you can get close. And I would say that's a team where, you don't even necessarily have to build entirely through the draft. Like if you were to get all together with Siakam and Anobi, if you were to just trade those guys alone, if you were to get six or seven first round picks from trading those two guys, let's say okay. six, let's be conservative, yeah. right? Yeah. What's to say you couldn't trade six first round picks and go bolster and improve your roster right now. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yeah, and if if I'm the Mavericks, I'm I'm phoning people. I'm yeah, phoning the Raptors. Yeah. I'm trying to get yeah. Siakam. I'm trying to get energy and Anobi. I'm checking. Here, price. But dude, that's but that's where the problem is, man. Dallas doesn't have a damn thing to trade. But they got they got picks at least. Do they? That's it. They have a few. Yeah, but they, they also they all they have no cap space because they also have terrible contracts. They would have to bundle a crap ton of picks just to get people to take those on. And that's before getting picks and value in return for the player that you're trading. <laughs> and you have to be careful too, if you're Dallas, because you know, you want a player that's been competing well this season, right? You don't want to take on another Porzingis or anything like that on, yeah. <laughs> on your team, or, right? Or another Davis Bertans. Right. <laughs> and they're, and they're past that mold of, Oh, we'll just draft talent. No, you got it. Like at this point, Luca, you're not going to be in the lottery with Luca. So like they're at a point now where it's like, what do you do with the assets you have? They got a clear cap, but if I'm if I'm looking at the Mavericks, I'm like, hey, listen, love the picks, but at the same time, f them picks. We got Luka Doncic, you know, playing some of his best basketball. You got to go get him talent, one way or another. If it's not through free agency, it's got to be through trade somehow, some way, because they're yeah. they're a sinkhole. The, the, the Mavericks. Well, I mean, it, yeah, the cap space is big, but I was just thinking, like, with this free agent class. You know, Dallas might not be a great free agent destination, but a Luka teammate very well could be. Well, I mean, but here's the thing, Troy. Like, they like they can say they can be a free agent destination all they want. With what cap space? They don't have like they don't have the room. They're yeah. strapped. Like they completely 
Like they're comp- like, do you want to know where their money's tied into? It's into Tim Hardaway Jr. It's into it's in Dorian Finney Smith. It's into it's into Reggie Bullock. It's into Davis Bertans. Like it's not into guys that can help Luka Doncic, you know, like win a championship. It's in freaking Maxi Kleber. It's in Dwight pa- like Dwight Powell's getting eleven million dollars. What are we doing here? Like oh, twenty, like only twenty two million dollars comes off the books this off season for them. Bertans is here through is here through twenty four twenty five. Hardaway twenty four twenty five. Finney Smith player option through 25 26. They just have these like these like mid eight these middling to below average contracts tied tied up long term. If Spencer Dinwiddie on 20 plus million dollars as well, like what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the only way I see that is a, is a team that's going into a rebuild that's like, hey, we'll take those contracts, but you, you got to give up, you got to give up some assets here, right. so they're screwed either way. Right. Um, they're in a tough spot. They really yeah. are. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that's, that's where the difficulties come in. But, you know, I, I, I think again, like, you know, for Toronto, like them in particular, like, I, I don't think they can position themselves to be like in the Victor Wembanyama sweepstakes by any means, but like, you know, if they can get another, you know, solid prospect to go, to go alongside Scotty Barnes, and then they go and make some trades and get some good role players around them. Like, they could potentially be cooking with gasoline here very soon. Like they're not a team where they would blow it up and they would be bad for years to come. Like they right. could actually be pretty good pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. It's just what they're doing right now, not it. We all agree on that. Yeah, we agree. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I as far as, you know, like anything else that happens at this deadline, I, I personally think that we're going to have no, I don't think we're going to have any idea of what's coming until like the week of, or even like 24 to 48 hours beforehand. I think some teams, I think some teams are not going to have any clue what they're going to actually be doing until 24 to 48 hours beforehand. Like, I think this is going to be a deadline where people are really going to be feeling some pressure and are really going to start questioning where they're at. And I think, you know, it's going to be fascinating to see how the the landscape of the league changes. (laughs) So fun. Especially, isn't it? especially in the West because of how wide open, I mean, you have your top contenders, but the rest, like from like three or four to down, it's all like a couple wins away. Like those teams are a big player away from really sneaking and getting in the playoffs. So the West to me has some teams out there that they're going to be buyers during the deadline, in my opinion. Yeah, most certainly. But guys, I mean, not only, you know, do we have the trade deadline coming up, we're close to the all-star break. I mean, it's the middle of the season for all intents and purposes. And we were talking about before the pod, we got to look at where, like where we're at right now. Like we got to make some predictions as far as like, you know, what teams we're liking, you know, like where, you know, where the league's at, like, you know, potential, you know, potential contenders, potential pretenders, teams we like teams we've been disappointed in. Let's start with, let's start with biggest surprise. Yeah. Sean, this- could you pull up? Um, well, I guess when we get there, as far as standings and playoff, could you pull up the the standings, the yep. current standings of today? Yep. Good. All right. Yep. Pulling yeah. it up right now. Yep, but biggest surprise in the NBA to you. So let's uh, let me start. Here is the overall standings for the. Uh, let me share my screen here. Just one second. My computer's I, I, being a piece. I got, of crap. I got a team in the West that I've been shocked with, by the way. And I don't, if you if you have the standings, it's the Sacramento Kings. Like yes, the Sacramento Kings are in the fourth seed. And they're on like a four game winning streak. Like they're they're playing they're playing great basketball. So yeah. shout out to it, honestly it, Mike. I mean the new coaching. He he already. I mean he was back in Cleveland last time he was a head coach. But nice to see him them winning games in Sacramento. I, I like Keegan Murray a lot. He's been nice for him as a rookie. They got nice pieces. Sacramento's hey, fun to watch. They got a Aaron lot of Fox has players. stepped up, man. Yeah, him and Aaron Sabonis Fox have well. made this their franchise, and you yeah. know have like have really made this their team and are establishing. You know, like this team isn't you know isn't the joke that we've made it to be for years. Like this team has legitimate principles, has a culture that they're playing around. And like Mike Brown is the one that's brought that from day one. Yep. For me, it's uh, the team uh, that I hear about every day here in Indy, the Pacers. Um, yeah, look man. At them. I mean, I know they're the AC. That's not like incredibly impressive, but we had them at 
13 or 14 this year. Um, but the production of Tyrese Halliburton and uh, even, you know, what you're getting out of like guys like Buddy Heald and uh, Miles Turner and even Jalen Smith. I mean, you're, you're getting production. Benedict from those guys. Ben- oh, Benedict Mathen, the biggest one right there um, coming in as a rookie. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm shocked. I'm shocked of that. They actually have a winning record. I know it's just one game above 500, but uh, they really have been playing well. And Tyrese Halliburton, like you said, Sean, um, future MVP really, oh, yeah. really has that potential. Oh, he really does. That guy's special. He, he might have the weirdest looking jump shot in the entire league, but you know, it's not a surprise when it goes in, you know, that the, the, the biggest thing about them is just, you know, like Rick Carlisle, you know, bringing that winning culture, you know, to, you know, to Indiana, having a lot of these solid, you know, players like the Pacers for years, they've not been this like bad team where they've been in the bottom of the standings. Like they've been in the play in standings or like towards the bottom of the playoff standings for, for like a number of years. So they have guys who know how to win games, who know how to play regular season basketball, who know how to play really hard. And so, you know, when you look at like the situation or in retrospect, it's like, oh yeah, it's no wonder that this team could actually be really good. But, you know, going into the year, this was a potential Wimbenyama landing spot for us. So, you know, the fact that this is a team that, you know, right now is pretty comfortably going to be in the play-in or the playoffs, like all like, kudos to them, man. I'm excited. I Like this is a team that I regularly tune in to watch because I'm excited to watch. And that, mm-hmm. and I never thought I'd say that about Pacers basketball. Never. Yeah, and the obvious one I got to bring up is the Utah Jazz. I mean, for a team that was pretty much just cash it everything in, traded away all their best players. I don't know if Rudy – I mean, he is technically their highest paid player, so throw him up there. But they they traded away everybody, and and still there they stand. In the the eight seed, ahead of the Wolves, and on top of that, you got Laurie Markkinen playing – some basketball that I never saw coming. I'm going to be honest with you. He's probably been the most shocking player this year for me to watch. I mean, he looks star like, Lori Markkinen, man. Dude, he's, yeah, he's, he's a dangerous man. So Utah to be in that, in the playoff conversation, it's, it, that's, that's super impressive, man. It, it really is. Yeah, for sure. I got to agree with you guys there. I think those are all, you know, great choices. You know, I, I, I think, you know, like for me, I, I'm going to go a little bit of a different direction. I would say the New York Knicks mm-hmm. have been, a real pleasant surprise as well to be a top 10 team in offense and defense for Jalen Brunson to be playing as well as he has. He just won Eastern conference player of the week, averaging 35 points a game. The point God Jalen Brunson. I mean, he's being sorely missed in Dallas and he's genuinely brought this team from being a, you know, fringe play in to you know bottom of the eastern conference to they're a solid fringe you know sixth to seventh seed and a really good competitive team that like in that could potentially trade for a superstar that could potentially like now for the first time in a while i look at the knicks and i go what the hell they have something yeah yeah and a big reason why by the way jalen brunson who y'all told me he sucked suck my dick anyway the shooting has been really impressive too with me just uh how he's shooting at such a high efficiency this season and another team too to throw in there the atlanta hawks i mean i I, that's probably been one of the most shockers too i know they're right outside they're in the play-in right now but for a team that we talked about being a top five team in the in the east i mean that's well, you can blame whoever you want. It, the whole season. Hey, so that's your biggest disappointment, biggest surprise in a bad way. Yeah, definitely. that's where I was going to go next was biggest yeah. disappointment. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think the Hawks are definitely a good one because bloody hell. I mean, I, I know they're in a little bit of a win streak. I know Dejounte Murray's been playing some good basketball. I know Trey Young statistically still has you know really high numbers. You know, I know he's an All Star player still, but I mean, man, they. I mean, they're reevaluating their entire front office. You know, John Collins has been on the trade market as, you know, pretty much my entire life. You know, like it's it's insane what's going on in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, scroll down to the West. My biggest appointment is hovering right at 11, Phoenix Suns. Now, oh, my Lord. I man. know, I know we didn't exactly think that they'd have as far as a regular season, a good, as good as a regular season as they had last year. But, I mean, I at least thought a top five seed, a top four seed um, this year. Um, but I think 
I they think Booker. I think we're I think <laughs> what we're seeing right now. I'm sorry to interrupt, Troy. Go ahead. But I think what we're seeing right now is Devin Booker, his excellent play was hiding the clear lack of 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 structure, lack of um lack of 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 calm and stability that's in the Phoenix Suns franchise right now because I think between the Robert Sarver transition, between the DeAndre Ayton, you know, view that clearly was never resolved between Monty Williams and the front office and, and DeAndre Ayton, it's clear he doesn't want to be there. Chris Paul getting paid all this money and, and having the sharp decline that he's having. Jay, uh, Jay Crowder not even being with the team and eventually essentially having little to no trade value. I mean, guys, this situation is going. Timber! I mean, it's unfortunate. bloody hell, guys. It's yeah. bad. Yeah. Troy, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean – the team that we saw last year is not even close to what we saw with the team this year. And I get Booker's out. I get all that. But even, yeah, we would talk about guys like Crowder had such a big um, influence on last season as well. And Cam Johnson too. I mean, it was just, it was such a fun team last year and this team just, it's not good. And, you know, I know all the drama with DeAndre Ayton this past summer, um, but in a lot of ways uh, he hasn't been impressive this season, at least what we thought he was capable of doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, if they can land a top 10 pick, great. I mean, I don't, I can't see it totally helping, but, um, I don't know. I, I'm very curious to see what Booker's future is going to be like. Yeah. Uh, moving if, forward. if I were the Suns, I would trade Deandre Ayton and, and see whatever value I can get in return. I try and retool around, around, uh, Booker bridges, see if you can possibly get another, you know, another, you know, all-star t- caliber player around Booker in the, in the, in the years to come. I mean, I think he's a guy that you try to make a son for life and you just cling on to those hopes and all that you can. And hopefully, you know, with, you know, with their new ownership coming in, which, you know, you know, which from the sounds of it, you know, these new owners, you know, being from, you know, what we know of them are very basketball, you know, are huge basketball lovers, you know, want to, you know, like clearly have wa- always wanted to own an NBA team. So I think once those guys come in, I have a feeling their pockets will be a little bit deeper than what Sarver was giving them. That's just, yeah. that's just some personal speculation there. And, and one more team I want to throw in. I wouldn't say they're a huge disappointment, but I, in a way they it, it has been disappointing. I got to say the Portland Trailblazers because that was a team that in the beginning of the season was a top of the West. And, and now over the last 13 games, they've only won four. Like they've been struggling lately. They have a full commentary of players, Dame Lillard. They have uh, Jeremy Grant, as we know, we're very familiar with Nurkic, Simons, and then they have coming off the bench. They have a nice, they have a nice roster, but they're not. They've been struggling lately, so that's yeah. kind of been one of my surprises. The, the, the Trailblazers just kind of clinging on to that tenth spot. I, yeah, I to me, I, I wouldn't say they're a surprise, Jeff. As much as I think they're maybe coming back to down to earth a little bit, because as you recall, to start the season, they were. At one point, they were a number one seed. For a while, yeah. they were top three, top four seed, which I think, you know, I, th- I certainly think with the addition of Jeremy Grant, I think we all thought Portland would be a good team or a competitive team, but I don't think any of us saw Portland as like a top power. No, I, I just, I thought I thought they were better than Utah. I mean, even Dallas, Sacramento. Right. Like there's some teams I'm probably more shocked by, but right. yeah, I'm not, I'm not, it's not like they were a contender, but. No, that's valid. No, no, yeah. no, but no, but no, but the disappointment is valid. I mean, they yeah. are, they have been slipping a little bit. They, they haven't been, you know, that same team that, you know, that started the season. You're not wrong. I mean, another team, you know, I know that we were kind of expecting them to be this, you know, be bad this year anyway, but. The Rockets are on a 10 game losing streak. Can we just point that out yeah. now? Like, I mean, which by They've the been way, healthy. They've been which, healthy, which by the way, when we go back to conversations earlier about, you know, about what, you know, like what the difference is in like a rebuild that has progress versus one that doesn't, I want, I earlier today, you know, like Martin Luther King day, I watched the Hornets play the Celtics and they had a lineup earlier that had all five players that were drafted by the Hornets. And of those five, only LaMelo was good. The rest of them, I couldn't really tell you anything about them. 
Like yeah. it was like half of them were second round picks from like over the last few years. It's like, oh no. Like you really realize outside of him. And then when they had Miles Bridges, there's no progress in that organization. And the Houston Rockets as well. I mean, guys, they're just free falling. I mean, they're Eric, Eric Gordon, like a few months, like, like, like a couple weeks ago, was like, yeah, there's no progress. Yeah, like Steven bad. Silas coming out and like freaking out on the court. I know the Pistons have been bad. They haven't had a 10 game losing streak bad. They haven't been that. Yeah. And as a fan of basketball, knowing what this draft um, is producing, especially who we know is going number one. Yeah. If I'm not a, okay, if I'm not a Pistons fan, and I'm just to say I'm a Celtics fan, you know, a team that's good, who's in no contention of Victor Wimanyama, and I'm looking at who will get Victor Wimanyama. I'm as a fan of basketball, I really hope Charlotte or Houston does not get Wimanyama because I just feel like they're I feel like if I'm in Victor Wimanyama's camp, how in the world? Yeah. Would you would you want to be in that in their shoes? How would you want right. that to be the situation that you end up at? You just because like you said, Troy, like if, if he goes to the Hornets, what faith do you have that they're going to be able to turn that ship around mm -hmm. and that if the Hornets are the ones that have Victor Women Yama's fate in their hands, that they're going to be able to turn that into a championship? They right. can't even they can't even get LaMelo like out of the plan. Yeah. Hey, he's, don't worry about it. Steve Clifford's there. He's doing a he's doing a fine job this year. That was a great. Yeah. it's just when you're a rookie going what in, or, or you're I a player know. about I to know. get drafted. You know, you want a good organization to play for, right? You you yeah. you want to be around at least maybe not you know all stars, but guys who can produce with you yeah. and for you. And I don't see either of those organizations. Sure, you can make an argument with Jalen Green, but I can't see Jalen Green and Victor Wimanyama having a, a healthy share the basketball kind yeah. of uh, uh, chemistry. So, if I'm Vic, I'm praying that I end up in Detroit or San Antonio. That, like, to me, those are the two, like, just unbiased. Those are the two best basketball fits for you know for Wimanyama. If he ends up in you know, if he ends up in San Antonio, you know, he's, you know, he's the next great big in the lineage of, you know, of Robinson, of Duncan, and now, and now Victor Wimanyama, he gets to be with Greg Popovich with a, t with a really young scrappy team, you know, that's, you know, that even though their record isn't great, they still play really hard basketball every night, solid organization with good structure. They treat their players well. If, you know, if you, if you stay and you win your family for life. You know, I think, you know, like, and, and then obviously Detroit with the levy of young talent they have, the, you know, the organ, you know, the organizational structure they put into place. I think, I think they, that would, those places both would be able to maximize Victor Wimanyama. I mean, Houston would be very intriguing, but they would have to make some significant changes to their roster and also to their coaching staff, to their, to their front office. Like they would have to blow everything else up pretty much. Cause I hate everything else they have in Houston. Jabari Smith jr. Has been a disappointment for them too. That's He's just been made, but hey, we, we, we talked about him going to Houston. It's bad fit. I mean, the two yeah. guys that are ball hogs that are, are not only just selfish, but they don't play winning basketball. Like those guys together, Kevin Porter jr. And Jalen green to me are the most interesting backcourt. Two guys that put up stats, but mean absolutely nothing. Like nothing comes from it. Uh, Sangoon was crowned the next great big in the league. I mean, he's been well, dude. He's Sangoon's right. really good. I've really enjoyed watching watching him play. He's, and everyone's like, he's been you solid. Watch Sangoon. He's the truth. He's the truth. And like, yeah, he's good. Don't get me wrong. I've never seen this man set a pick in my life. There's certain <laughs> like there's certain like like there's certain possessions where he's just sitting in the post. And he's just watching Jalen Green and Michael Porter, Michael yeah. Porter Jr. dribble and dribble, 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 which is cool. But like at a certain point when you're big, it's like, hey, how can I help this offense flow? How yeah. can I possibly help create some separation? Like, what can I do? You know what I mean? Like yep. at some point, you got to do something, man. Yeah. And a part of that's on coaching too. Like that's 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 up to the coach to instill that system, that philosophy in which they want to play with. And they don't really have a philosophy. It's just kind of like, all right, Jalen Green, Kevin Porter Jr put the ball in their hands and we'll, we'll roll with whatever happens. All right. Mid, all right. I, I, I want to end this mid season awards with, with some predictions. I want right now who your mid season MVP is. Mm -hmm. And I want what your current mid season finals matchup is. If the, if the NBA finals were to, were to start tomorrow based off of everything that we know, what two teams do you think would be there? Troy, you can go. 
Yeah, I'll start with MVP. Um, I guess it's a it's a wrestle match between um, – I'm going to go with Tatum and I'm going to go with uh, Doncic. Um, Doncic is my favorite player. The stats that he's producing uh, is just unreal. But also Jason Tatum is producing similar stat, a little more higher in the scoring, a little bit less maybe in the assists, but winning basketball. Winning basketball like – I did not expect out of Boston this year, especially with his production. Now I know they're going to be good, but I didn't think they'd be this good. So well, I, I'm probably actually going to lean a little more towards Tatum, especially after uh, today's 51 point game against the Hornets. I get it's the Hornets, but still 51 points against any NBA team is rough. And he's had multiple games, uh, uh, you know, above 40 this year. So I'm, I'm going to have to lean, lean towards Tatum for my MVP. As far as NBA finals, I'm going to go with the Celtics out of the East still. And the West is just so interesting. But I see this year, I see something coming out of the Grizzlies. I'm picking John and the the Grizzlies. I think this is the year. Man, I like it. Jeff, where are you at? Uh, MVP, I'm going to go Jason Tatum. Uh, best player on the best team. He's, he's been incredible all season. I mean, Boston to me, and, and this kind of goes into my next point about why I, I agree with you, Troy. They're my favorite coming out. I know Milwaukee's one of those teams that I'm interested to see a, a Celtic Bucks matchup with a healthy Bucks team. That's probably the number one thing I want to watch because Milwaukee technically hasn't really been dethroned when healthy, mm-hmm. but Boston to me, they can win on the road. They can win at home. Like they're, they're such a complete team. Like I'm pretty sure their home record similar to their, their away record. Like they're winning games period. I like the Celtics out of the East, the, the West, the West to me, they're, they're top heavy. And the team that I, I think has more experience in the postseason. I like the Grizzlies. They're young, they're running and gunning. Give me the best team in, in both conferences. I give me give me the Denver Nuggets. I, I, I like the Nuggets this season. I, I think as a complete team, they have not only a, a head coach with, with a ton of experience, they have the best player who I think is in the MVP conversation, Jokic. They have a healthy roster if it can stay healthy. I mean, last year was Jokic fighting against the entire Warriors roster. I think this season he's gonna have some help. Give me the uh give me the give me the Denver Nuggets coming out of the West. Oh, I'd be glued to that TV if it was Nuggets Celtics. That'd be such a good finals. That would be a great finals. Yeah. My personal MVP, I love the Jason Tatum pick, especially because of everything that he's done for that franchise, the steps that he's taken as a slasher, as a scorer, everything that he's done this year, the level that he's taken his game, the, you know, the overall play that, you know, that he's at. Jason Tatum is one of the best players in the world. It's unquestioned. I love, you know, the Luka Doncic, Luka Doncic mentioned, you know, he's certainly someone that deserves to be in that conversation. I feel like there's genuine grounds to say that we could have Nikola Jokic win the MVP third year in a row. Yeah. And I think that conversation is starting to gain more and more traction, especially with how well Denver's doing. And especially you look at the context of what's made them so good and why they've been so good. Like Jamal Murray's been like been available, but it's not like he's been the Jamal Murray of old, right? Mm-hmm. It's mostly yet again, been Nikola Jokic bringing this team to the promised land, putting this team you know, on his shoulders, like Michael Porter Jr., you know, he's been available for the most part. He's been fine, but he isn't the guy that they signed to that max contract and they were hoping for him to be, right? It's been Jokic. And so, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to see, like, what happens going down the postseason stretch. I, I'm with you guys that, you know, I I personally believe that Boston's the most well-rounded team, you know, in, in the conference right now, and unless – I think I think well I think the Bucks would have to make a trade and get an acquisition. They would have to get a Bojan type in order to push them over the top. They need a little more juice because as much as Giannis brings, as great as Drew Holiday is, you know, I just think they need a little bit more scoring power, you know, on that team. And, you know, especially to go over overcome Boston because they can beat you in so many different directions. So as of today, if nothing changes, it's Boston out of the East for me. And I might sound crazy for this, but the Golden State Warriors, to me, until until proven otherwise, are the best team in the Western Conference. Because I know, I know the standings say otherwise. I know, I know they're technically in the play-in tournament right now. I know that they've been kind of like up and down, but Steph Curry's back. They weathered the storm that was his injury. This team, even though they've only had five wins on the road. 
thus far this season. I personally have a lot of confidence in them, you know, being able to turn, you know, turn that ship around and to write that. I mean, we've seen this team repeatedly win pressure games on the road. So yeah. I have full confidence that they can write that. And in addition, they're one of the best home teams, you know, in the entire league going into the, going into the chase center is always difficult. And for me, I love the Memphis pick, but I think the fact that they, you know, the fact that they're saying that Boston to them is who they're looking at and that the Western conference, they feel like they have locked up. I feel like the warriors might have some, aspect, it might have some extra motivation to prove those young kids otherwise. So to me right now, I think until I see, you know, anyone dethrone Steph and now the fact that they're going to be going into the playoffs with a healthy and and what from what we're seeing high level Clay Thompson alongside a healthy Steph and Wiggins and Draymond and Poole they're dangerous, man. Yeah, no fault in that pick. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so, with you. Yeah. So a lot of things can happen, but Jeff, I want to come to you, my guy. Mm -hmm. Last week we were last week we were trading players, we were firing coaches. We're 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 trying to get we're you're essentially just asking us if we want to like make people lose their jobs. Well, so this, this time I got a spin on this week. I, I'm going to ask you, and we kind of went through some teams that have been disappointing, but enough of the disappointing and surprises. I want to ask you guys, we're going to play a game, pretenders or contenders. And, and I want right. to go through a couple of teams. <laughs> and you're going to tell me if these teams are fakers or the, or the, or the, real, de the real deal here. So I'm going to go through it. I'm going to start in the East, uh, go through a couple teams. And the first one I'm going to start with, fourth in the Eastern Conference, you know who it is, baby, the Philadelphia 76ers. Yeah. And I, I have my thoughts on the 76ers, but I want, you, I want it from the horse's mouth. Uh, I'll start with you, Sean. 76ers this year, fourth in the East. But are they pretenders? Or are they legitimate contenders? Pretenders. <laughs> yum. Listen, man. I Joel Embiid is is a great player. James Harden is, you know, we've seen what he can be as a playmaker. Why would I trust Doc Rivers in a playoff series at this point? Why would I trust James Harden? in a playoff series with all the data that we have, why would I trust even Joel Embiid, who as much, you know, as much talk and, and criticism as he gave Ben Simmons down the stretch of those playoff series, he wasn't exactly playing prime basketball himself. So yep. I, listen, man, until they, until they prove me otherwise, do I think they can beat the bucks in a playoff series? No. Do I think they can beat the, the Celtics in a playoff series? No, I just don't. Yeah, I'm going to also go with Sean on this, but I, I wanted at first to, to say contenders just because I'm a huge Joel Embiid guy and uh, I'm very high on him. And uh, I know we haven't seen it in the playoffs, but I just – every year I keep telling myself it's his year. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the, the biggest reason why I'm going to go with pretenders is similar to what Sean said at the end. He said Milwaukee and Boston – but if the playoffs started today, they'd be playing Cleveland, and I can't even see them getting past Cleveland. So oh, hey, you know what? no. You know what? That brings me to my next team, the right. Cleveland Cavaliers, a team that sits fifth in the Eastern Conference. That was the yeah. next one I was going to bring up, a team that was formed not with Donovan. We've seen some big games out of Donovan. He had 71-11 and 11 already this season. What do, you, what do you think about the Cavaliers? I know we've talked about them. We, we like what they've built, but are they legitimate contenders, as in finals contenders, or are they pretenders where they uh, might fall short? I'm going to say – I'm going to say that they're pretenders in the sense that I don't think there's a reality that this team makes the finals this season. However, this is a team that I think has the potential to upset a Philly mm. or a Milwaukee mm. and perhaps even a Boston, right? This is a team that I think could, there's, there's potential this team could lose in the first round. There's potential this team could get to the conference finals. I think they have an insanely high ceiling, and I think the future is is incredibly bright. I just think for now, I don't think this you know this year, I don't think Evan Mo the combination of Mobley, Garland, and Mitchell is enough to bring them to a finals just yeah. yet. I, I I'm gonna go with contenders just because I think they they can definitely make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, and if they make the Eastern Conference Finals, 
who knows what could happen no matter who you're playing. And, um, and who, who knows yeah. if they have the assets to, but like sure. if they make a trade as well, like you never know, these yeah. teams can improve. Yeah. Yep. I, I just think Donovan Mitchell is, is on a mission and Darius Garland I, has even taken up uh, a bigger leap um, than I think he's a better player this year than he was last year. And that's saying something. Um, so I, I just think with, both of them. And yeah, Mobley hasn't been maybe exactly where you want him to be. But uh, for me, I don't know. I, I just think Donovan Mitchell is a superstar in this league. And if you have a superstar in this league with surrounding pieces like he does, anything's possible. So I'm going to go with, uh, do I think they're going to make the finals? No. But can they? Yes. And Troy, you know what that sounds like? You guys both kind of talked about it. It sounded like you were talking about Trey. Remember the, the Hawks with Trey Young when they made that run? Nobody expected. I think they were a fourth or fifth seed as well. Yeah. And they snuck yeah. in. They got yeah. to the Eastern Conference Finals. And then you're just looking at it like, yeah, they're they're happy to be here. I don't think they're getting past the Bucks, But yeah. the reality is they can go on a run like that. I, I'm with you guys. But, but I, I'm going to say they fall short. And I'll say pretenders. Just yeah. this season. I'm with you, Sean. I think the difference is, though, is that, like, the, the difference is, is that this team, unlike that Hawks team, like, you could legitimately see that run coming. Like with the Hawks, like when they were there, it was like, what the yeah, f- are yeah. they doing there? Like it was like no disrespect, but that roster was not a conference finals team. That team was not one of the four best teams in the National Basketball Association. They weren't even one of the four best teams in their conference. And they had an interim head coach. <laughs> yeah, freaking interim head coach, Trey Young, and then like, you know, just a ton of guys. And then now they're mm-hmm. ass. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, I just and, like I just like saying ass. I don't no, know it's, why. It's, I think it's the perfect word to describe it. Uh, yeah. I want to go. I want to go to the West. I got two teams here. Uh, first one I'm going to bring up is a team that I liked before the season and uh, didn't know that Kawhi Leonard would miss essentially half the damn season because he's been load managing every other game. L.A. Clippers. What do you guys see them at? Uh, you I like the talent they have, but let's be honest here. I mean, it, it hasn't been coming all together this season. Kawhi hasn't been there. Are they contenders? Are they pretenders? Troy. Yeah, I'm not going to compare them to the Cavs. Um, they're, they're completely different teams. But I, they're a team that went healthy, and, and when things are clicking, I can see them be a conference finals team. Um, but an, an NBA finals team, I'm going to have to go with uh, no. Therefore, I'm going to have to go with pretenders. Now, again, I love this team from the get-go, from the start. Uh, Paul George has been impressive this season, uh, to, to say the least. But to the NBA finals, uh, can they get past Denver? I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, even even a Memphis. I don't think so. Therefore, I'm going to have to go with pretender. Yeah, absolute pretender. I mean, like this is a team where you know by this point, if Kawhi's not ready now, and like he he's only played 19 games at this point, like he hasn't been out there for for very long at all. There's mm-hmm. still little to no cohesion between him and Paul George. There's still little to no understanding and, 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 and comprehension of like what their overall direction is. Like, I just, this is a team where it's like, oh, they are, they could be dangerous. They could be a threat. And it's like, yeah, if I'm the Pelicans, I don't want to have to like, if, if that's the team they have to play today, like, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult first round draw, but like Pelicans and six, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, it's like, <laughs> I, like easy you know what i'm saying like that's it's like they'll they'll put up a fight but at the end of the day it's like at the root of it all i think this team's core i think their best days you know i have have passed them by quicker than they could you know quicker they than they could assemble something that could legitimately contend i think that's where they're at and you you already you you guys are giving me layups here you guys are giving me lobs Uh, the next team is new orleans pelicans third in the Western Conference, a team that Sean was very high on. Zion's been balling. They have a complete team. They 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 go deep. Willie Green's been doing a good job. But let's be honest, realistically, chips are all in the middle. Are they contenders? Or are they pretenders? Yeah. Um. Do I think they're better than Memphis and Denver? No. But could they beat either one in a playoff series? Could they? Could they? Yeah. When you have Ingram healthy, uh, putting up big time numbers. When you have Zion being Zion, um, I mean, for me, and and this is a scrappy team. Even a guy like Jose Alvarado, you know, has been playing great basketball last year and this year too. So for me, you know, they gave Phoenix a run for the money um, in the first round. Was Yeah, they played the first round last year. Yeah, yeah, they did. Um, so, I mean, and they're, they didn't have really Zion right there too. So I just feel like 
this year um, can be their year. And if it can be their year, then of course they're going to be contenders. Yeah. Listen, they have everything they need in house. I think as of right now, there's no reason to not see them as a contender because I think when you look at the Western conference, they're one of the teams that this conference goes through currently. I think, you know, you look at the, the amount of talent they have, it's not just Zion. It's, you know, it's guys like Brandon Ingram who has playoff experience, who we've seen, you know, play stellar basketball. I mean, guys, remember, this is a team that, that put Phoenix on the ropes last year with no Zion. Now give this team a healthy, athletic, great-looking Zion Williamson. Give this team CJ. Give this team Brandon Ingram. To give this team all the pieces that they have. Who knows if they make moves at the deadline? They they absolutely could. But even if they don't, you could make a legitimate argument that this is the deepest team in basketball, mm-hmm. from top to, to from top yep. to bottom. Yep. The only thing we don't know is is can this team get it done when it matters most? That's the only thing we don't know. We know from the talent perspective, they have everything in spades. We know from the coaching standpoint, they have everything that they need. We know from a momentum standpoint, they've been they've been on fire all season long. Like ever, like if you were to check the list of like potent, like of what would make a contender, they check every single box. Now it's time to see if they're for real. Mm-hmm. So to me, I say they're contenders until they prove otherwise. No, I, I'm I'm with you guys. I think we we have so far. Th- what only one team is a legitimate contender other than that they're all they're all kind of on the fence there besides the clippers they stink but everybody else kind of on the fence well i think that speaks to the fact like for one though like like first of all there is true parity but i think they're like i think there's like true parity in the sense that the middle of the league is extremely competitive yep but i think there's still a, a, a considerate separation from the top of the league to the bottom like you know what i mean there's like there's there's the there's like there's the celtics there's the bucks there's the there's the nets there's the you know all there's the teams that have these generational superstars and then there's everyone else that's just that's just the way it is right it works and at the end of the day as long as you have one of these guys you're always going to find yourself in the mix that's why new orleans is there because they finally have their guy available ready to go Memphis is there because they have jaw golden state. You know, it's been shaky because their guy was in and out, right? Like that's, that's how this league works. The Pistons, their season tanked because their guy has been out all year. Right. Like if you want to just simplify it to like the most simple of terms, it all begins with that, with that, with that cornerstone piece, that one, you know, that talent that brings you over the hump. But anyway, Jeff, I, I I like that segment a lot. I like to I love talking about contending. I love talking playoff picture because you know we I, we talk a lot about like what teams are bringing to the court, and we talk a lot about like you know like their quality of play and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, what matters most are they getting the dub? Are they get are they bringing home the hardware? Yeah. That's what matters. Yeah, no question. And with that, we when and, and with that we bring hardware into consideration when we're talking about from Mount Rushmore. And there's no better person to lead that than my guy, Troy Sergio. With that, Troy, what do you have for us today? Yeah, we've been talking a lot about teams, franchises, direction of teams and franchises. Now we're going to go big scale with this one, big picture. We're going to do the Mount Rushmore of best NBA franchises of all time. Now, one and two might be pretty easy. And three and four, we could have some fun with because we can go two different directions here. Strictly make it as easy as possible and say the the four most wind uh, franchises of all time. There you go. There's your best franchises. Or we can go the direction of teams that constantly are producing good rosters. If it's a good playoff run each and every year um, or just constantly in that mix, hardly ever rebuilding. You know, we could make that a direction in greatest franchises. Um, that maybe doesn't fully take championships into account. So I'm going to start first. Most obvious, in my opinion, the Boston Celtics. Um, you know, they're stretched in the 50s and 60s with Bill Russell, uh, winningest, winningest pl- player slash coach person of all time. And then you get into the 1980s with Larry Bird and Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish. Uh, 90s, you have a little bit of a slack off. But then you draft a guy named Paul Pierce from Kansas. 
Uh, he really only won one championship uh, in 2008 with them, but you surround a guy like Kevin Garnett with him and Ray Allen, and uh, you're in the, the Eastern Conference Finals a few times. You make the finals that next year, or two years later, I'm sorry, in 2010. Um, you're a team that uh, constantly is in the playoffs, constantly in that upper tier uh, each and every year. Uh, for me, you would be the biggest fool if you did not put the Boston Celtics on your Mount Rushmore. Yeah. And can I, mean, I throw- yeah, they're one of the original. Yeah. I mean, they're just one of the two teams. They just, they have to be there. Like they literally are basketball history. Like, yeah. yeah. And I know the easy one to bring up, you'd be, well, the Lakers. Now, now I'm going to go San Antonio Spurs. I, I think the model of consistency they've had with Greg Popovich and just a stat too, speaking of the Lakers, the Lakers would have to win 370 consecutive games to have a higher winning percentage than the San Antonio Spurs. Think about that for a second, too. Talk about consistency, um, the amount of championships they've been able to get with Greg Popovich now and, and playoff appearances, never missed a playoff um, until recently. I think the San Antonio Spurs got to be in that conversation. Other than the you know marquee franchises, San Antonio is all the great players they have. I think they, I read a stat somewhere they have 54 all-star players in their 41 seasons. Like that's – Speaks for itself. There. Craziest stat I heard to to your point, Jeff. Tim Duncan has yeah. more wins than the Minnesota Timberwolves franchise has. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's we we, we that's laugh, true. but it's a true fact. Yeah, that San that's Antonio, incredible. Baby. That is impressive, man. Timmy Duncan, man, one of the all time. I mean, you could literally make Greg Popovich. A, a category of this like he is the yeah, Greg Popovich. it's insane but i mean jeff you went you went the fun route of going with an interesting team i'll go the boring route and i'll just bring up the lakers i mean when you think of showtime when you think of mm. of of dazzling plays uh legendary basketball players the legacy of the game you think of the lakers when you think of of the elite stage when you think of basketball history you think of wilt you think of the showtime lakers you think of kareem magic like they you know elgin baylor you know they just have a lineage of 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 all-time greats and as much you know as much as we look at the glitz and glamour what the lakers have been of late and you know a little bit of the circus that they've been before that they set the standard of 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 making basketball not only you know like of what it means to build winning programs and to build winning teams. But in addition, everything that they brought to the entertainment aspect of basketball, the way that they brought uh, celebrities into the game, the way that they changed, you know, so many different aspects of, of everything that we know about the league and the product that we see right now. A lot of that's because of the Los Angeles Lakers. So they have to be there because of the fact that, you know, not only are they foundational, not only are they one of the winningest franchises ever, but, They've shaped not only the way basketball's played today, but the way basketball's consumed today, the way basketball's watched today. Yeah, no question. Yeah, love it. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I know it's more of an entertainment show, but Showtime on HBO Max. Uh, check it out if you haven't. Yeah, now, um, yeah, personally, and now, because like I want to, like, you know, like start, like, ask you guys when I look at this fourth team, I know that we could go, like, I, I, because I, I have two teams in mind. And, and I'm curious to like know what your guys' thoughts are. I, to me, you could go with the Bulls or the Warriors here, in my opinion. Those are the two teams that that that, that in my opinion have have are are in contention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do I add a third team there too? Go ahead. Go ahead. This hate. I hate this team. This is my least favorite team in the league for years on end. I can't stand them. But if you look at their championship. In 2006, if you look at the LeBron era, if you look at even that run in 2020 in the bubble, the Miami Heat, they're they're not they're a very new franchise. Early 90s, they came into to being. But since they've been into being, no, 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 uh, no, 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 but, but here's but no, no, but here's here's where here's where that fails, though, Troy, because at the end of the day, yes, if, if you're talking about the success and you're talking about just within the time of them being a franchise, they are definitely one of the most like just like their success rate is 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 arguably the highest of any franchise but at its core there is no world as great as the heat have been as dominant as the heatles were when we're talking greatest teams in the history of the league there's no world that that team jumps on over say 
the Golden State Warriors with Durant, Draymond, Curry, uh, you know, Clay and everything that they have, but also Jordan and Pippen and that team. Like the Chicago Bulls, I I would argue should be the fourth team. And the reason why I make that argument is they haven't been relevant as a basketball team in almost 20 years. And they are still by far one of the most recognizable brands in the sport. Yeah. I like you, you go I around saying, I wasn't saying the heat should be the fourth, but no, 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 bringing no. them into that conversation. No, I'm not. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I, and I wasn't saying that you, that you were yeah. saying they should, I'm just saying the reason why they're not like, that's why I was just like, that is a great argument. However, <laughs> Michael freaking Jordan and then the Warriors that we saw go 73 and nine and then add Kevin Durant. You know what I mean? It's like, like, like the Warriors, like because of the greatness that they were as a franchise over the last decade became the most valuable franchise in basketball. They were a joke when I was in middle school. Mm -hmm. Now they're the most valuable franchise because of the greatness they've had over the last decade. But at the same time, like the, like the Jordan era and the dominance of that, like the, like the bulls, like the bulls logo is almost, it's almost transcended basketball. It's, it's like a fashion statement. It's an, it's a cultural icon. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because of what that team was. And I, and I would argue there's almost like, I mean, like, yes, like I like I, I would argue like there's only really three franchises that have that type of recognition in the league. I'd say it's the Lakers, the Celtics, and the Bulls. Yeah. So Sean, Warriors or Bulls? Who gets the fourth? I, I'd say Bulls for those reasons. That's my argument. I'd love to know your guys' thoughts. You know, significance and if because if you're looking at dynasties, both those teams, I agree, deserve to be in the conversation. I, I think what's probably separates, and I think the Warriors still have a chance, they're still playing, so they could kind of change that narrative a little bit. The Bulls have you know, Hall of Fame players in the GOAT. I mean, they have Michael Jordan. He was the face of the NBA during that time and the dominance he had. So I'd probably give a slight edge to the Bulls, but I'm with you, Sean. I think the Warriors and the Bulls, those two, I mean, you, you pick one. I mean, what? It, mm -hmm. and the Warriors are still going, so we'll see what happens. Right. And um, with that, too, the Bulls did make a conference finals back in 2011 there with yeah. Derrick Rose and Luau Dang. So there's a little bit of success post-Jordan, but not really anything. And then in the 70s, the Warriors did win a championship with Rick Barry, yeah. RB4, Steph Curry. So, yeah, I mean, as much as, you know, we we have those two franchises, there's still a little bit of success beyond those two. I wanted to at least give credit where credit is due. Oh, yeah. No, um, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, if, if we are talking about, like, you know, honorable mentions and we are looking at, you know, like, like what teams could potentially enter that conversation. Like if we are like five years in, from now, 10 years from now, looking at contenders for that conversation, I mean, the Miami heat in a very short time as a franchise have already built quite a legacy. Right. And you know, like the warriors, like who knows what they do over the next few years, who knows what, what type of legacy the Grizzlies start to lay for themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like we have no idea what the league's going to look like you know, five years from now, let alone two years from now, because right. these prospects coming in could completely change the landscape and everything that we know about the game itself. Yep. It's insane. Yeah. Yep. And when that happens, this is going to be the place that you're going to want to be because we're going to be breaking it all down. We're going to be, sh we're going to be showcasing it all. We're going to be breaking every single damn moment down. Every I'm so excited for the deadline. I'm excited for everything coming down the pipeline, guys. It's there's going to be so much to talk about and I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else than these guys here. Be sure you follow my guy Troy Sergey on Twitter at Troy Sergey 44 and my boy Jeff at Jeff I afraid he also catch my guy Jeff on the morning show Monday through Friday on the Woodward Sports 8 to 10 a.m. but also folks, be sure you subscribe to the channel so you're not missing more NBA and Pistons content. But with that folks, thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you guys next Huh? From Half Court. Be sure you subscribe.